All right, so for those of you just tuning in, we're about to spectate a 3v3 on the map Arabia between my viewers as part of my weekly Twitch TV live streams. If you want to get in on this, you can find my live stream schedule by going to my Twitch page and scrolling underneath the video player there. So, the topic of today's video is going to be, when should you build military units? Yes. Generally in my videos, I like to talk about various things on the economy side, because that's usually where new players tend to struggle. And I recommend if you're new, to definitely focus on that, making sure your town center is always working, always creating villagers, and remember to keep <laughs> building additional town centers. You probably want around four town centers total at the end of the game, and around 100-ish villagers. Alright, let's, let's start this game. But, just to mix it up, I'm going to start going over some examples in this particular commentary today, on reasons why and when you would, for example, neglect to build another town center. That is, of course, why we're playing on the map Arabia, which is one of the more aggressive maps in the game. AOE2HD stopped responding, but then it continued responding, so that's good. Second, it appears that OBS has... Oh, God damn it! Um, one moment. Hopefully I can fix this real fast. Just need to get... I blame HD Spaghetti Code. We have fixed the we fixed the CLR browser. We're into the game, and the topic of, again today's video is going to be on reasons why you would start <laughs> making military units. On the stream, Elite Goat, good to see you as well. Uh, v Rita's bird. So, basically, when you, you for your first the first thing that you have to keep in mind is what kind of map you're playing, and that's heavily going to determine the strategy that you go for. We're playing on Arabia, and there are two types of maps in Age of Empires too. Generally speaking, we have open and closed maps. Obviously, there are water and land maps but for the purposes of today. We have open and closed maps. Closed maps are ones that are actually very easy to wall up and defend on, whereas open maps have a look at wide open fields, which can be difficult to close off. If we're taking a look at Arabia, Arabia is obviously an open map. Now, Reaper's base is actually somewhat wallable, Based off just the way the terrain has generated, it's always going to vary from game to game, and you're going to have to scout around to see what kind of map generation you have. But Arabia is typically a more aggressive uh, map because it's harder to wall. Rush strategies are just significantly more viable. If you're playing on a map like Black Forest or Arena, then you definitely want to be focusing more on your economy in the early game because you're not going to be able to get your military units through those walls to get in there and start raiding the economy. That's why we see scouts, archers, Militia, for example, all being excellent early game rush units. See a little bit of a boar lure coming in here, but Reaper should be fine on this one. Very nice. This is one of the ways he's going to be boosting his early game economy. He's going to pull this underneath his town center. Have his villagers force drop off the food from that goat. And if he timed this perfectly, yeah, it should be directly underneath the town center. This is a great little way to boost your economy. So well done there from Reaper. So on an open map, generally speaking, you don't want to go for a fast castle age and not build any military units until the castle age, unless you're in the pocket position. There are two positions in your team. There's the pocket, which means you're surrounded by your teammates, and then the flank position, which means you're adjacent to an enemy. Here's one of our teams. We have gray, blue, and red. Red is our flank, gray is our flank, and red is actually quite, quite close to yellow, whereas the rush distance between these two players is actually quite large. So the Black Winds and Assassin are going to want to consider making military units in the Dark and Feudal Age. I want to stream uh, Bowen Dons. <laughs> well, as well, Epic Acer, welcome. Uh, Alex, I'll, I'll go over the map a little bit, uh, Mad Fuck Ryan, soon. Welcome as well, Byzantine Shimmer, good to see you guys. So yes, these two players are a flank, and from doing some scouting, they'll be able to figure out rather easily that they are very close to each other. So they're both going to want to make some military units in the Dark and Feudal Age. What if you're Reaper, though? Reaper is in the pocket. He's not adjacent to anybody. That means that, generally speaking, he's going to want to go for a fast Castle Age and then start making military units in the Castle Age. Why is that? It's mostly because of this concept of rush distance. Reaper is so far away from his opponents that unless he makes some mounted units like Scout Cavalry, if he was going for, like, a Dark Age rush with Militia, by the time his Militia actually get to his opponent, like Slenderlight, Slenderlike is already going to be in the Feudal Age. It's going to take so long for his units to walk from point A to point B, and that's really going to weaken the effectiveness of that rush. That's generally why we see pocket players go to the Castle Age first, then start making Knights, because Knights are a unit that's very strong against Feudal Age military units. It's very difficult to counter, and if you go straight to the enemy flank, remember, they had to make military units earlier because they're so close to their opponent, they can't possibly risk being rushed. So you can probably punish them with Knights really hard, um, and they're also mobile enough that you can feasibly get across the map and do some serious damage. 
So overall, that's an excellent strategy for pocket players. Obviously, not every Civ has access to Knights, and in that case, you've got some options. If it's HD edition, you know, you can make some Eagle Warriors, for example. Maybe you have a unique unit like the Plumed Archer that makes sense for something like that. You can go for Conquistadors. You've got options, but when you're in the pocket, you want to be thinking of mobility. And when you're on the flank, you want to be thinking about keeping yourself alive versus early game rushes. And this is one thing that we see Assassin doing right now, is he knows that, again, rush distance is short. So what's he going to do on the military side to keep himself alive? He's building his barracks here in this choke point, which means if he builds a palisade wall to the left over here, which he didn't do, he would actually be able to wall this off. Looks like he's trying to set up a little bit of a makeshift wall off, and that should be fairly good for him as a way to deter early game rushes. So, this is also a reason why you wouldn't want to build additional town centers, of course, which is one of the most common pieces of advice I give, is new players, they're either on one town center the entire game, or their town centers are perpetually idle. If your economy is too small, and you have fewer than 100 villagers by the end of the game, you're not going to have enough resource income to actually sustain military unit production. And that's a guaranteed surefire way to lose the game. The thing is, is though, is that you're also guaranteed to lose the game. Not guaranteed, but you're certainly increasing your chances of losing if you built additional town centers early on on Arabia if you're the flank. Assassin is right adjacent to the Blacklands. It's going to be very difficult for him to get away with investing all of his early game resources in the economy, and then he just gets punished by a Drush, for example. And right now we see the Blacklands getting raided by some militia. Assassin is making these early military units because he's right there. The militia and early game rushes are all about timing. You need to get in there when your opponent is still vulnerable, and the Blacklands is currently. Let's go to the Blacklands' perspective. Yeah, so he's actually not even ready to click up to the Feudal Age yet, doesn't quite have enough food. Now he's going to have to deal with this Drush. And another important concept with early game rushes is this idea that you don't actually have to kill any military units for it, uh, any uh, of your opponent's villagers with your military units for it to be effective. But rather, look at the Blacklands. Right now he's forced to pull his villagers off the line. By the way, he has to do this, this is not a misplay. He has to pull his villagers off the line to try and fight back against those militia. Uh, and while he's doing that, those villagers are not actually gathering any resources, and for economy purposes, they might as well be dead. This is a little bit of unfortunate micro here, is that one militia kind of just died for free. Um, you have to be very careful with how you assign your gather points, and he didn't pull his villagers off in sync. And right now we see Assassin also kiting these villagers back again, just trying to get as much idle time on them as possible. But the Blackwinds is making the right decision, though, by doing some focus firing down on the militia, rather than spreading out his damage. And we see here some better micro. Should be able to pick those Militia off over time. Yes, and he is correctly attacking the low HP one. You do have to continually click your opponent's military and just to try and get a good feel for their health bars. It's one of the more annoying and or supposedly skill-intensive aspects of Age of Empires 2 is micromanaging those, uh, those health bars. Uh, as far as Drush timing goes, Smith PGD, it, it varies, but you know, you probably want those Militia in your opponent's base before 10 minutes in because you want to get there before they're in the Feudal Age, ideally. Now, granted, it's possible as well to delay your Drush, um, and then, you know, go for Men at Arms, for example, or just if you have Militia left over, going for Men at Arms can potentially be viable. Uh, the Blackwinds put his barracks in a fairly good position, by the way, as well as his house. Again, we see him cradling his lumber camp, creating sort of a makeshift uh, funnel into his town center, which is going to be the area that you're going to want to avoid when you're going for early game rushes. So the Black Winds, kind of on the back foot right now, forced to make a defensive militia to try and deal with this and didn't really quite work out. Assassin's still going to be a nuisance, but he's not really going to be able to accomplish too much at this point. And yeah. So if you're on the flank, you're being pressured. Probably don't build another town center. Actually, it's funny because Scission is a player that I've played with the most, who I would say is most known for his like one town center aggressive pushes. Now, Scission's actually a super aggressive player. Uh, I see that you know all the time. Whenever you're playing first decision, you gotta scout that fog of war because you never know if he's gonna drop that castle on you and go for some sort of one town center all in. And going for obviously like a, a one town center all in like that is a huge, huge risk. But there are benefits to doing that, of course. The risks, though, which I'll first go over, is if you're going for like a one town center all-in castle drop, your economy is so small you need a microscope to see it. And that means you're going to be so far behind your opponent. If this rush fails, you will have a really difficult time making up for that economy discrepancy. It's going to be so hard for you to claw your way back into the game. So that's why we call it an all-in, because if it doesn't work, you're probably going to lose. So it's risky in that respect. But your opponent probably invested more in his economy uh, than you did, so he should have fewer military units. He should have less stone 
So that way he's less likely to have a defensive castle. So he's going to be more vulnerable, but if he survives, he should win the game. And in that sense, it's a gamble, and it's going to take a ridiculous amount of practice. Just You just have to keep playing the game to get a good feel for whether or not you have an advantage. Welcome to the stream, uh, Jay Pence. Good to see you again, my friend. So basically, it just takes experience to know when you should uh, go all in, for example, make those cuts to your economy, because you're going to have to evaluate the situation. Age of Empires 2 is a game that is fundamentally about incomplete information, and to me, that's one of the many aspects of this game that makes it interesting, is that you just don't know what your opponent is doing at all times. So you have to be able to get these cues, scout out around a little bit, and with that incomplete information, make an educated guess to figure out whether or not you're capable of going all in. Because obviously, if you guess that wrong, you lose. Assassin right now, again, making some significant cuts to his economy to go for a tower rush. But the Black Ones on the defense with the Vietnamese. He is going to maybe be able to deny this watchtower. Great focus fire down on the scout. He has to be careful about that watchtower. Now Assassin going to focus fire down these archers. But the Black Ones gets one archer underneath it at the minimum range. This is great. When your opponent is going for a tower rush, you want to make sure those villagers are trapped underneath the watchtower. Very nicely done from the Black Winds. Assassin gets absolutely denied. Has to play very defensively. He really wants to build this tower, but they usually try and daisy chain them because they have a minimum range. He wants to build this tower within the range of his other one. Does get a free militia kill, but... This is going to be really tricky. The Black Winds has to wait for another archer to come out if he wants to take this down, but he has to be so careful with this archer. I think this is a bit of a mistake, actually, pulling this archer out from underneath. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But he knows he has to stop this tower from going up at all costs. I don't think building any more militia is going to work. <laughs> oh, no. But if he can just kill this villager, then maybe it's all worthwhile, but I don't think it is. <laughs> God. <laughs> this is so absolutely so messy. So many villagers going down the drain. Where's the Benny Hill theme when you need it? This builder, though, will <laughs> escape. Absolute disaster. Absolute disaster. But uh, the Black Winds, though, even though this is not the cleanest anti-trust defense at all, the Black Winds is doing a good job denying that watchtower. So if this watchtower went up, he'd be in honestly a lot of trouble. He would. And these villagers will die. Ooh, Fletching upgrade coming out for Assassin. These villagers will die. They will be forced to exit out this tower, and now they're vulnerable right for the pickings. So I think the momentum will swing back. I think the Black Winds will probably be okay. Maybe... Uh-oh. Uh well, this is when I pan the camera somewhere else. This is when we cut the video. <laughs> Things are not looking so good for yellow right now. But in the meantime, let's go look at the rest of the map. Again, that was a very good initial defense. It almost worked, but now Assassin is pulling, uh, is pulling ahead. So, really right now what we need is we need Slenderlike to come to the rescue. Our Lord and Savior, the Pocket. <laughs> Where are those military units? Here they are. Look at Slender Light. He's been watching my videos on YouTube. He knows that when you are in the pocket, you want to focus on mobility with your military units. This thing is clearly riding a horse, so the cavalry archer is the optimal choice for the situation. Why else is it good? Because he's the Huns. The Huns have cheaper cavalry archers. Generally, though, cavalry archers will not be the answer unless you have some sort of Civ bonus to them. But the Huns do, and that's a great option for them in the Castle Age. Black is in a lot of trouble. Slenderlike is going to have to come to the rescue here. Actually, Knights would have been better here because of the tower rush, but I don't know if Slenderlike had enough notice on that, although the Black Winds did correctly communicate that over chat. So the reason that Knights would be better here is because we knew that Assassin is going for skirms, and this is why communication is so important when you're rushing. Um, if your opponent's going for skirms like this and the towers are here, the cavalry archers are not going to be that great of a defense. The other way to deal with the tower rush is with a defensive tower like the Black Winds is doing, but he really didn't want to do this, and he wasn't quite ready for it on the eco side either, so he's going to get seriously punished by this, but wow, sudden, somehow he only lost a villager from that. He just needs Slenderlike to come in here and punish Assassin, and lo and behold, here it comes. So Slenderlike, since he didn't go for knights, he is making the right decision here, and hopefully, let me know if any of the advice I gave in this video is helpful to you. It's the hope. Uh... Slenderlike is making the right play by going straight for Assassin's Economy rather than going to defend the Black Ones. Why is this the right play? Okay, one, really you want to defend your teammate most of the time. You definitely don't want the Black Ones to die because in that case it's going to be a two versus three and it's going to be very difficult to clear with that. The reason that going into Assassin's base is correct, though, is because he went for Cav Archers. Cav Archers are not going to be able to remove these towers. Knights might be able to if you have enough, especially with plus one uh, defense. Uh, and... The cavalry archers themselves just take so much damage from those towers. So here we know that Assassin is going for a tower rush. One of the main weaknesses of them is that 
these towers are static. Uh, I would call them static defense, but here they're a static offense. So this means that he is guaranteed to have almost no defense at home. So this way he can catch him off guard, and we know Assassin again went for Skirm, so it's pretty poor mobility there. Uh, and yeah, Slenderlake just going to run away with this game. So the Black Winds really crippled, but hopefully this should be worthwhile, because again, the Black Winds knows what's up. He is constantly creating villagers. He knows the most important thing he can do at this stage is to stem the bleeding, cauterize the wound, and rebuild his economy, then focus on the military units. The thing is, is though, is that that's what you do when you're behind. When you're not behind, though, and you're on the flank, you want to at least open up by focusing on the military side of things. At this point, though, there's no possible way he can compete on the military side. His goal should just be to build back up. So, Assassin is in deep trouble. His economy is in absolute shambles. He did not get that tower up. He's actually so unbelievably screwed. So this is when Reaper, C <laughs> this is when Reaper CH is going to make military units, right? Here comes the knights. Uh-oh. So, obviously, some of these players are, you know, they're around, like, the mid to lower mid rating area, so we don't expect perfection, which is why I give this advice. Um, this is just for future reference, of course. We do not expect these players to make all the right plays all the time, of course. This is not, this is not the Viper. So, for future reference for your own games, this might seem cute and a good idea, but it's not quite. Why? Look how slow this is. We were talking about rush distance earlier, and rush distance determines very heavily whether or not you're going to rush. Reaper is running for Elite Skirms, which is the counter unit, so it's definitely a great choice in that respect, but look how long it is taking those Skirms to get here. By the time he's made it here, Assassin has dropped so low in score, he is just dying. Camel's coming. Hope Troy booms to imp. I mean, yeah, that would be, uh... a. <laughs> That would be kind of nice. Uh, who is the camels? Uh, is it going to be camels from the Saracens? Oh, camels coming in from uh, from Corbic. Okay, so that's nice. Yeah, Corbic making some camels. Should be fine here. Should be able to hold the line. Uh, yeah, just really the elite skirms. I mean, as nice as they are, he will actually zone them back just because it's a pretty inefficient trade. Although I do feel like Sunderlight could actually take that fight if he wanted to. I mean, he does definitely have the military advantage there. It's just a messy situation. <laughs> I think going for knights would have been better. Actually, honestly, going for camels would have been the best possible option. Uh, camels even faster than knights, actually, and just a great counter to the, uh, you know, Huns army comp of Cav Archers plus knights. It's worth noting that the Huns are a very, like, binary civilization and predictable, but only in the late stages of the game. This sim has a super narrow tech tree where, you know, you would expect cavalry archers and knights from them um, a large portion of the time to be the bulk of their army in the later stages of the game. But in the early game, this sieve can be quite unpredictable and very, very versatile. And this is just because in the early game, the civilizations kind of bleed together a little bit. It's really just all about your economy, uh, your economy bonuses, and whether or not you have anything early that would really sway you. Like, you know, the Magyars, obviously, they want to go for scouts all the time, but... Um, sometimes, obviously, you know, they're going to go for archers or whatever. It's just early game, the sieves are are very similar. The tech tree differences only come into play super later on in the game, so early on, you know, the Huns, since they save all this wood from not having to build houses, can certainly go for a great, excellent, excellent rush. They can go for crossbowmen in the Castle Age with no problems whatsoever, because their lack of arbalest doesn't come into play into the Imperial Age. So hopefully that makes sense. But in the later stages, though, this sieve can certainly become quite predictable, and really just does not deal with the Indians well at all. Imperial Camels are very difficult for the Huns to deal with. So. Kirby coming in here. Great of him, by the way, to get the plus two defense on his uh, camels. I actually think it's only plus one, because I think they start with plus one. He is getting uh, out micro very hard by Slenderlight, though. <laughs> See how he kites them around so the camels take uh, tons of free damage without actually dealing any? Oh my. Yeah. The, it's important to get the defense upgrades, though, when you're dealing with ranged units or you're trying to raid. That way you can actually get up to the opponent's units and actually do some damage. Somehow Assassin got to the Castle Age, so great on him. Not waste any resources making military units, and just get to the Castle Age. Where hopefully he can start building town centers, start building up his economy, <laughs> and do the topic of every video besides this one, which is uh, focus on that eco when you're behind. Because now Assassin is behind. But when you're ahead or you're even, and you're in a, like, a position where you can actually apply some pressure like Slenderlike is doing, now is the time to put it on thick. Go hard. Go in there, make a mangonel, and get him good. Reaper is in for a lot. He's in, he's in for rude awakening, I suppose. As the mangonel's not. Okay, never mind. It's actually not coming at all. He does not have enough gold. 
little bit unfortunate for him. He's actually going to drop a proxy gold mine over there to try and squeeze that one out. So, meanwhile, on the other side of the map, all quiet on the purple front. And this is great, because I can't always guarantee that I'm going to get a good example of whether or not you should make military units. But this is excellent. So, Troy, playing very well. Actually playing exactly how I used to. Um, which is just play super defensively no matter what. And this is not a good idea. Why? Because we're playing on Arabia. So building this defense was really expensive for him and very time consuming. So that probably slowed him down quite a bit, having to pull off all these villagers to do the stone walling. Not only that, uh, and also mine that stone. Not only that, if he was actually making military units and applying pressure, because the old militia, this is the ace in the hole. If he was applying pressure with his military units, they would have already won the game. Slenderlike is just light years ahead of his opponents. Oh, here comes the battle elephants. That's why the Black Winds is the best. This is why he's a mod. <laughs> well played, my friend. If he was making military units, this game would have already been over. He's playing super defensively. This is fine. This is clearly a strategy that he's comfortable with. And I always emphasize that players should play with what they're comfortable with. They should. Don't go super... Obviously, you want to practice in your, your free time, getting used to a wider variety of strategies. So you don't want to... You know, do a scout rush builder when you're clearly terrible at it and just lose. It's something you should practice, of course, but comfort can be more important depending on how terrible your scout rush is, for example. <laughs> it depends. Definitely practice it, though. Get a wider variety of strategies under your belt. Play to your strengths. Do what you're comfortable with. Everyone has their own unique play style. But in general, though, this is not a great idea. He is doing a great job booming up, but if he just made some military units, this game would have been over. And you want to focus on your eco when you're behind and then make the mil minimum amount of military units possible to keep yourself alive. That way you have enough of an eco that you can possibly compete in military. But in this case, they have a definitive lead. He can just come in there, finish the game if he wants. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> I play a lot more aggressively now than I used to, like, eight to ten years ago. Uh, because I've recognized since then that the fast castle age is an excellent strategy and probably the most important one to master, but... Making early military units on Arabia can absolutely work out. Also, the thing is with this defense is that this defense was too slow uh, against a rush. Like, he's finishing the walls now, it's just that if Corbic ended up attacking him, which Corbic did not have that option. Check out this new Indian's architecture from Rise of the Raja. It's really snazzy, right? This is not a mod, this is actually just a free thing that Forgotten Empires uh, did for us. So, yeah, if he just made some military units, he would have been fine because... I don't know, these stone walls, they, they take too long to go up. Corby could have just come in here and done some serious damage while he had no defense. But Troy gets away with it this game, which is A-OK. -okay. And now, Assassin also making a great play with this defensive castle. This is excellent. So, another example. When would you want to cripple your economy to keep yourself alive? Because sometimes, you don't get to focus on your economy when you're being pressured. Sometimes you gotta take a Hail Mary. He crippled his own economy here. Assassin realize that the only way he can possibly survive is by putting a ton of his villagers on stone and or buying stone at the market and building a castle. What does the castle do for us? The castle forces the game almost always to go to the Imperial Age. It's a great stalling tool and really the ultimate defense, assuming your opponent didn't get to him. And then now you must once again focus heavily on that eco so you can get to the Imperial Age, that way you can defend against enemy trebuchets. Otherwise you lose again. This is a great play on Assassin's part to really weaken his own economy, go for this castle just to give him a bit of breathing room. And now he's going to make a monastery as well. That way he can make some monks try and defend himself. Because while you do want to build up your economy when you're behind to actually possibly have a chance at winning, you have to make some military units to defend. And monks are a great choice. Mangonels are a great choice. Welcome to stream the same bot, by the way. As well as uh, Hajor Elite. I do not have my PC specs below the stream. I should probably do that. Uh, welcome to the stream as well. Platinum Fix. So, Assassin really having a rough game here. Uh, he's actually a good player. Uh, Arabia is not his cup of tea, though, but, I mean, he's getting 3v1. I mean, he, he has had some assistance from his teammates, and Reaper is booming up, so you gotta give him credit where credit's due. He's got a nice, well-balanced army comp. He's made plenty of military units, but the thing is, is there's a slender like just kind of running away with this game here. <laughs> oh me, oh my. Uh, Troy, I think, was the lowest-rated player in this game, right? And... But we can see here, though, that he 
he has his priorities generally in the right place. This is why, <laughs> this is why I always tell people to focus on mastering the economy side first, because you can get away with so much when you have the money to play badly. But if you're poor, it doesn't matter how good your micro is, but if you have one skirmisher, only the Viper can win that game, and there's only one of him. So, <laughs> definitely focus on the eco side first. Make sure you get that down, and then start polishing off your military. But for those of you who are a bit more comfortable on the eco side, now's the time to start considering your offensive options. Make that tough decision to decide to drop a castle on your opponent. Make the early game militia. Go for a Drush, perhaps. But Troy, we see that he, he's a little slow, which is why he's on the low-rated side. But overall, he is doing a lot of things that are right. And this is why I'm sure his ELO will go up over time. He's got an excellent foundation as an Age of Empires player. See, he's got multiple types of military buildings. He's got several of them as well. He has more than one town center. This is great. He has a nicely placed defensive castle to protect his farmers and his economy. Great. This town center placement, excellent too. Right up against the tree line. Also, next to some minerals. Great protection here. The zone of denial. Multiple lumber camps. I Every time I see a player who doesn't replace his lumber camp and their villagers have to walk, you know, from... <laughs> they have to walk from Florida to Alaska every time just to drop off 10 wood. My heart goes out to them, but I'm assuming that the villagers at that point have calves the size of melons. So yes, good foundation here. Yeah, I'm just I'm happy to see this. Uh, castle placement, again, excellent. So a little bit on the slower side, but the priorities are in the right place. He's got the skirms out here, although he definitely wants fletching, I think. Otherwise, the skirms are so very weak. Really need that fletching upgrade. Meanwhile, the pressure is on. Um, it's so weird to see Arabia Games look like this? <laughs> see what Assassin... Uh, yeah, Assassin, unfortunately, is just so far behind because he's been like, ganged up on the entire game. There's no way he's gonna get to him. So this game is basically over, but I think it's a great example of when to make military is. This game could have been over a long time ago, uh, but on the sa on the flip side, it, it could have gone the other way, and Assassin bought himself a lot of time by crippling the Black Winds, I think, but what he really needed was he needed some more assistance. He needed some faster assistance. Uh, and I think that it really sucks when all three players are in your base, because in a normal game of Age of Empires 2, you would expect these two players to be fighting, then these two players to be fighting, and then the pockets helping out on either side. But that's not the case here. Perhaps part of the reason is is because Corbic feels like he has to come over here, and that's true. I'm going to call GG. And also because Troy is walled up like heck. Stonewalling... See, look, he's even closing off these gaps. Stonewalling like this can honestly definitely work on Arabia, but it's a risk. You're kind of hedging your bets, and... Going for it that early with no military units can be a big, big risk indeed. Good, even another town center. This is great. So he's got an excellent foundation, but they are going to close out this game. With Assassin down, it's going to be so hard for them to claw their way back into the game. <laughs> GG well played. It's a short one, but I think one that was extremely educational, hopefully. Um, and hopefully you guys better understand now when you should be making military units and why, and when those kind of trade-offs can be valuable. Obviously dropping this forward castle here, he knew he was far enough ahead that... He's going to get to the Imperial Age first. Slender, like, knew this. So that way, Assassin can't just easily treb this down. If you make that mistake with the Castle Drop, that can also easily lose you the game. So you want to make sure that you're ahead enough, uh, or your opponent is far enough away from the Imperial Age that you can drop this kind of castle. Because dropping a castle once people are an Imp is absolute suicide almost all the time. Because <laughs> it just dies. <laughs> Reaper's going to go for one last epic fight. That right, sounds good to me. Don't know how many military units they actually have. <laughs> Luckman says Troy's a nice guy like me. This is uh, this is exactly like my my fun kind of casual play style, and this this works on maps like that aren't Arabia and can work on Arabia, but it's a bit of a risk. He certainly got away with it here too. And if you scout your opponent and you see that they don't have a barracks and you know round before 12 minutes in, then they're probably going for a fast castle age as well, and that will influence your build significantly. So scouting is extremely extremely important. If you scout in your opponent's base and it's the Dark Age and they're mining stone, either they're terrible at the game, or they're going to tower rush you, which means you need to make some early military and it's maybe a defensive tower of your own to try and deal with that. You need to scout him more aggressively to see what he's doing. Or they could be terrible, because <laughs> one thing in Age of Empires that's very important is you don't want to waste too much of your villagers and your economy in the Dark Age on mining golden stone heavily. Uh, at least until around close to when you're able to start advancing to the Feudal Age. That's going to be a huge waste. If they're mining stone, like, at three minutes in the game, they're not tower rushing you. They're just 900 Hila. But if they are mining stone and it's, like, ten minutes in, you better be careful because 
It could either be a fast castle agent to a castle of some sort. Maybe they're going to castle drop you, put a defensive castle, go for conquistadors. Or maybe you're going to get tower rushed. <laughs> McKay says, or they're terrible at the game and will still trust you. You've got options. <laughs> well, the stream, uh, Sap Chicken and Makobo. Great to see you guys. I will, uh, I will leave the game in just a moment. But, uh... Okay, oh yeah, I just realized that Reaper resigned, so I'm actually just going to leave the game now, because I guess Corvik is probably going to sit in here. I don't know if he won one last battle, but he's got his Imperial Camels. We know he's absolutely going to lose this game, and I feel like I've said my piece. These guys played well. <laughs> and the Blackwinds holds on. He has survived, built back his economy, he's got all these town centers. Now, of course, by the way, I encourage you guys to check out some of the tutorials that I have on my YouTube channel, particularly my tutorial on the Night Rush, I think is incredibly useful and if you're new to the game then that video covers almost everything that you need to know to get online and start kicking butt it's a super comprehensive tutorial that can be adapted for a wide variety of strategies if you check the video description or just go through my youtube channel i've got plenty more age of empires 2 content i've got tutorials super comprehensive ones expert games gameplay videos civilization matchup analysis we've got civilization overviews for all the new civs all those are super helpful tools to help you learn the game in addition to that, I also have videos for other games on my channel, and I really appreciate those of you who take the time to show your support for that. It really helps the longevity of the channel. So thank you so much. Because of you, this way I can keep producing AOE content for the foreseeable future and also bring more people to the Age of Empires community. So yes, yes, yes. Find the live streaming schedule on my Twitch page. If you follow me on Facebook and Twitter, you'll get notifications of when I'm streaming next. Slender like just kind of ran away with this game. <laughs> That's because Assassin uh, had to play so, so aggressively. Here's the thing, he played so aggressively that even though I think that those two players would have been on even footing, he just was not prepared for Slenderlike's offense. If Assassin did not go so all-in on that tower rush, he probably would have been able to defend just fine, but he also needed significant backup too, so that's just... It's, it's really difficult. <laughs> that game could have gone so many different ways. Uh, Assassin could have played significantly more defensively, not gone for towers, but then he wouldn't have crippled the black ones as much. Really what he needed though was faster assistance. <laughs> I would have saved him. GG, well played. We're going to be back in a couple of minutes with the next match of the live stream, so please do stay tuned. We'll be right back, guys. Don't go anywhere. Now we're not done for the day. There's another game. Morpheus Red Pill says, love the vids. First time here in the stream watching a full match. Keep it up, bro. Really like what you're doing. Thank you so much, Morpheus Red Pill. Appreciate it. I think the tower rush was a fine idea. He just had to... I just don't think he anticipated that he would get attacked so aggressively by Slender-like. But, you know, it's a double-edged sword. That's the entire point of today's video, is that going for a tower rush like that is a double-edged sword. While you're more likely to take the Black Winds out of the game, uh, because Assassin is a super proficient player, at the same time, Black Winds didn't die, and then Slender-like got to exploit that Assassin had no defense at home. So, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. That's the whole point. Um, so I can definitely see the argument on both sides. It could have worked. Thank you so much, Miss Aimbot. 